Well, part of our trip to Idaho is I wanted to stop and see my niece, our niece, Stacy. And uh, we wanted to show you what Stacy is up to. Now, Stacy and I have been friends all our lives. Since birth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she came along when I was 13 years old. Wait till you see her artwork. So hi, I'm Stacy. I've been doing glass work since I was about six. I discovered broken glass in the gravel at the junior high school in my neighborhood and started making little collage pieces with it, gluing it on wax paper, letting it dry, and then when you hold it up, you see the light. So I remember doing that. And my grandmother was a creative genius. And one of the things that she always emphasized is whatever tool you need to get the effect that you want, you use it, even if it's your toenail, which I thought was kind of gross, but anything that you can use to make your artwork get to the point that you want it is what you do. And I learned that from my grandmother, who is very creative and also my uncle's mom. So that's where that comes from. Um, why glass? Glass is amazing. The only thing that alters it is force or fire. So when you heat it up, it melts and it flows and it changes color and it does all kinds of things. The other thing that you do with glass is you break it and force or fire. So the force, there's always tools. So there's tools to chop it. There's tools to cut it, although I don't see my oh, tools to score it. And scoring just means giving the glass a path to break on in a fashion that it's going to go where you want it to, as opposed to breaking it with a hammer. I know what's going to happen when I use a glass cutter. So one of the ways to alter glass is by cutting it. This is a tungsten carbide wheel on here. This is called a comfort grip. There's many different styles of glass cutters, but you want is to be able to score the glass and you don't have to cut through the glass, you just have to give it a path to break on. And this is one of my new running pliers and you just give it a gentle squeeze. And you gotta be able to see your score line. And that's one way to alter your glass. The other way is if you need to cut a designated size over and over and over again, a jig system is probably the best way to go. And score. Harder. From the other side. There we go. And having a little ruler here is also very helpful. This system right here was invented by Morton, Don Morton, who has been selling this forever and ever and ever in a day. Look him up. It's called the Morton system and kind of revolutionized cutting glass all at the same time at the same sizes, repetitive cuts. So it's really helped for people who do a lot of geometric shapes. This is a tool that I just purchased and I uh, avoided it for a long time because I'm old school and I use this tool right here, which is also a running plier. It's got the line on here and a curve. So it's curved. You put this under your score and this goes on top and it breaks the glass. Well, this has this tiny little nub. You can see that little nub there. And then this goes across the score line. And what it's allowed me to do is be able to cut really skinny, skinny, skinny strips. So I'm gonna double my width here because it's another little trick if you wanna cut really skinny. So I'm gonna cut double. And then I'm gonna come in and cut that first line that I made. 
so it allows you to get these You're really kidding. skinny pieces. Yeah. And there's a trick to it. And and being able to manage each cut and have it come out just the way you want it. Exactly. Over and over and over again. So that would be the force altering of glass. Yeah. The heat altering of glass is where you actually take sheets of glass. And this is made with three separate 10 by 10 sheets. There's clear on the bottom. There's this robin's egg blue which is the blue, and then there's another piece on top. And what's cool about this glass is it's reactive. So when, it, when this glass comes in contact with the blue, it's called a reactive red. And how it starts out is like this. So it comes out brown and clear. Let's see if we can get a color of that. Mm -hmm. And when it fires, it changes to this color and it's called petrified wood. So wait, this glass brought out all these colors? All this, all those colors. Oh. Is that amazing? That is amazing. So Bullseye Glass Company that started in Portland, Oregon, manufactures this glass. And they, I think they have a hard time keeping it in stock because it's so pretty and you never know what it's going to do. And that's one of my favorite things about altering glass with fire is it changes. It's liquid. When you get to play with molten glass, if you've ever watched glass blowing, they won't tell you this most of the time, but it's a drug because you get addicted to just that change in shape and color and form. And you're basically playing with molten hot glass and fire and it's a blast. So that's, I might be addicted a little bit. Okay, so... One of the processes, again, um, especially with the pen, this is a process I developed to teach classes with. I wanted to do um, collage in glass where you have layers and layers that look like they're different techniques put together, which isn't always easy in glass because it's glass and you have to change its shape with color and being able to draw on the glass and get fine detailed lines and then color them in allowed me to write on glass. It allowed me to draw layers of trees that if I was just using the fine granulated glass, I'd never be able to get that detail. So this is a process that's a lot of fun. I take traditional glass paint and I mix it with clove oil. And the clove oil is a medium to allow me to pick the glass up with my calligraphy pen. And you mix and you mix and you mix. And as you're working with it, the glass or the paint, which is fine granulated glass and some metals. And if you don't mix it, it settles to the bottom. So I will draw for a while, mix for a while, draw for a while, mix for a while. So with trees, trees are pretty easy. But to get depth in the trees, you need to have layers. Layers and layers and layers. So what I'll do, and most of the time I'll have a picture behind, but for the purposes of video, we're just gonna draw And if we had smell a vision you'd be able to smell the clove oil. It smells like cooking, cooking in the kitchen with cookies and clove oil. <laughs> yeah, I can smell it. It's real strong. But it's very pleasant. So once I get one tree done, I can actually turn it over. At this point, I would actually dry this, but for video purposes, we're just going to go ahead and set that down and not move it. And then my next tree, I can set over that and I can fill in more branches. So what I would do is just go over the top and put branches where I don't have any yet. Is that going to give it a 3D effect too? Absolutely. I can do multiple layers this way. I've done trees with as many as five layers. And I can just fill it in and I could just keep building this up. And then once that's done, I would fire it and then I would go back and decorate and put color on it if I want to. Or I would just leave it a winter tree, 
with that process, I'm able to create these layers in the tree. And I think this is three layers of glass. So a tree and then more branches and then more branches. And I've laid that up over the top of blue glass. This is not done with just sheet glass. I've actually taken mm. and mixed this granulated glass in all the different colors and layered it up and layered and layered. And this is three firings. So one firing to do the trees, the next firing to do the color, and the third firing is to give it the texture. So these actually stand up off of the glass. So all of these little parts here. And then when it was all done, I had left little tiny holes in the glass so I could wire another third element to the outside of the glass. The raven's nest. Yes. So he's got How some, cool. or she's got some eggs in the nest and Oh, it's beautiful. This is one of my favorite pieces. Yeah. So when I do shows and I have to sell things, I just put a price on there that I won't feel bad if it goes. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> I like this one. In my living room, I have another one of those pieces that I'm never going to sell. So this tree was done in three firings and it's layers and layers and layers of glass. And the photos that are being shown are the process. So the first thing I did was draw the tree and then I layered, I put that upside down in the kiln and then I layered the green glass behind it. And once that came out, I then added all of these three dimensional elements to it that I made out of what's called, um, it's glass clay. So you mix it with a medium, it's fine powder and a medium that you mix in and you actually can make clay out of it, which can be molded and rolled and shaped. And then I made all of these. And once it was all fired, I put it all together, fired it again and added this level to it. And after that was done, I started on the wire work. I quit counting the weeks of how long that took to do the wire work. And I had to walk away from it several times because you, once you start working on something like this, you want it done and you find yourself rushing through it. And I didn't want to do that. So I would leave it alone for a couple of weeks and then come back to it. And once I did all of these little fine detailed wire, it was really important to me that they would all move. So they all wiggle. And I do have to give a shout out to my friend Ruth. So when I first moved out to Idaho, I did not have a kiln. And my friend had moved to Tennessee and had a kiln that she never used. So when I moved out here, I bought her kiln and she shipped it to me. And this is the first piece that came out of that kiln. Mm -hmm. And she began the wire work on the tree. 
the trunk is all hers and then I continued to embellish. So I can't really sell it because of that either. So yeah. hanging on to your artwork. It's really nice, Stacy. Thank you. So this raven is a piece that I did. I've collected fall colored glass for years because this is my favorite time of year. And the raven, I'm just partial to. I think they're so cool. They're smart. They hang out. And I really wanted to do something to use all the glass I've been collecting. So this piece is all altered with mosaic nippers and shaping all the little edges. I love, the, I love the way the blue sky comes through. Yeah, got the little bit of blue yeah. popping out. And I don't know if the camera's gonna pick this up very well, but he's iridescent. So I think if I can shift the light on it. Maybe, let me get my flashlight out. Okay. I don't know if that's gonna yeah. hit. Oh, it does, yep. Yeah, so he's just got a lot of detail. Oh yeah, you don't see that until I light it up from this side. Yeah. And the wow. fun, the fun thing about this piece too is it changes throughout the day. As the light changes, the all the colors change a little bit, more more shadow. And then at night, he really pops out because the light from the inside of the room makes him shine. All right, so these are my fishes. And another thing I love about glass is how it changes with the light. So right now it's a little dark and then it pops. So. Does. This piece, again, was done with all the detail work with the calligraphy pen. So we've got all the details in the leaves, the gills on the fish, and then all of the color was done with that fine granulated glass. So you just start layering and layering and layering and layering. This piece took about a week to do all the frit work, and it was done in two firings. So the first firing was done upside down, and then the second firing was done right side up to get the surface shiny again. Once this surface comes in contact with the kiln shelf, it gets dull. And then when you turn it over and fire it, it gets back shiny again. All the fishermen watching this video are gonna be wanting this piece. <laughs> yeah. It is beautiful. It's, it's my, my sockeye. Yeah. Go fish, go. Oh, and man. again, with the fall leaves, you might sense a theme here. I really enjoy the fall color. Oh yeah. Wow, the detail is incredible. Really nice. Thank you. This piece here is the equivalent of about eight layers of glass. So it's very, very deep. The bottom layer is the black and then there's layers and layers and layers of clear iridescent glass. The leaves were done by actually casting a leaf into plaster, taking the leaf out and then filling the plaster with all the different colors of glass and firing it. And then you get the three dimensional look. So this was done in two firings and the clear base first, and then the leaves were added on top of that and just tack fused, which means just heating it up enough for the glass to get sticky, which happens at about 1275 degrees. Yeah, wow, that is nice. Yeah, you like fall, don't you? I do, just a bit. It's, <laughs> it's a thing. Oh, cool. So this is a reproduction Tiffany lamp, and it's called the Apple Blossom and Spiderweb. I'm going to see if I can loosen this up to turn it. So each panel is different. And you can see the gradation of color. This lamp took me 10 years to do, only because I had to find the glass that went with this glass. This is a one-of-a-kind sheet of glass, and if you can see close, it has all these little black lines in it, and I thought it would be perfect for this shade, and then I couldn't find any glass to match the background. And I did have one picked out, but it was the wrong color of blue. It was more of a cobalt blue instead of a turquoise blue, so it sat, and it sat, and it sat. And then I moved to Idaho, and I actually found the right color of glass. And once I started working on it, I think it took about a month and a half from finally getting all the glass, cutting all the pattern pieces. So each one of these pieces, you make a pattern so you can lay it out on the glass and figure out where to cut all your colors and 
trying to gradiate color from light to dark and finding pieces that had a little bit of green so there'd be a reflection of the leaf. And then I don't know if Rick can get it this really close on the spider. So all of this detail is done with solder. I didn't even see that. Yeah. So the branches. It's all textured. Yeah. And in the stills, it shows all the, the process of yeah. building up the branches. Yeah, it's way beyond just soldering. The solder itself is textured. That's incredible. Now, when you make a Tiffany lamp like that, is it done flat first and then bent? It's done on a form. So the very first process is patterns. And then the next process is cutting all your glass and you're laying it out on flat forms with light. And you use different types of light. Uh, most lamps have an incandescent bulb. You would never use fluorescent to light your glass up. Mm -hmm. And once it's all done flat, then there's a mold that it's a fiberglass mold and it has beeswax painted on it so it's sticky. So you take each piece of glass and grind it to fit on that mold and stick it to it. And then once that is all done, then you start to copper foil each piece. So each piece of glass has copper foil tape wrapped around it and it's burnished down and then it's soldered. And in the soldering process, you have to solder horizontal because it, the solder would run downhill. So there's a form that, or a tool that you actually manipulate the lampshade and you rotate it as you solder. So all your surfaces are horizontal while you're soldering it. Kind of like a lazy Susan kind of a thing or a... Yeah. 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 And it's... Vertical though. It is. It's actually a lazy Susan rotisserie. and it... Rotisserie. Yeah. It's a rotisserie. And a rotisserie. Got it. Yeah. Uh, there are four and a half pounds of solder in this lampshade. So each roll of solder is a pound and it took four and a half rolls of solder to do. So this is a portrait, a pet portrait that I did of one of our dogs that we lost. Um, the process is very similar to the paint process that I showed you before. This image was done upside down and backwards. So the piece of glass started out face down and I started with the eyes. The very first thing in any portrait that I do of an animal is the eyes because they, they tell the story most of the time. And then it's just layers and layers and layers of glass frit. So to actually look at the image while I was working on it, I had to elevate it over a mirror so I could see what I was doing and how the layering process was going. And then after it was all fired and you get all the depth of color, I then took and painted over the surface to get the fine hairs in his face. So he's uh, he's near and dear. He's a he was a good boy. So as an artist, um, when I first started, I didn't take classes because I was like, I know my stuff. And as I aged a little bit and realized there was so much to learn, I started taking classes. And you also have a background in restoration. I do have a background in restoration. It's yeah. one of my favorite things. One of the things that I did early on and throughout my career is restoration work for churches and residences, mostly churches. <clears throat> Stained glass is made with lead. 
and lead is like people. As it ages, it gets old and brittle. So over time, 70, 80, 90 years, that lead starts to break down and fall apart. And as an, a restoration specialist, because it was one of the things that was near and dear to my heart, was we would take old windows, take them out of the churches. We would make a rubbing, which is basically taking uh, paper over the top of it and making a pattern and then piece by piece, taking the window apart, cleaning each piece, and then rebuilding the window with new lead. So it has another hundred years or so to go. Wow. And one of the reasons I love restoration so much is in a hundred years, somebody's going to be doing that to the windows that I built. They're going to be redoing them. And going through the process of touching another artist's work was just, you know, when you think about the time and the effort and the amount of work that they were able to do without the convenience of the tools that we have now, the soldering irons were not electric. They were heated with coal and and gas, and they would heat the iron up and they'd solder, and then they'd reheat the iron up and solder. And our irons keep a consistent temperature, so it's easy to use. You don't have to worry about melting a hole through the lead because the, the temperature is consistent all the time. So restoration's pretty fun. I don't really get a chance to do that anymore in Idaho, but my windows will be there for hundreds of years. So there you go. One of the things is never stop learning. So I am in the middle of taking a class right now and I actually can't show you what I'm doing because I signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. I've been cutting glass for more than 40 years and I started watching this couple's artwork come on to some of the forums that I follow and I've never seen glass cut like this. So I'm taking a class from them and I'm learning a ton and one of the ways that you manipulate the glass for this is with mosaic nippers. And the raven that I did in the mosaic, this is the same tool that you use for that. And you're actually able to cut very tiny pieces. So you can actually take and shape the glass with little tiny pieces and just shape it and shape it and shape it and get whatever shapes that you want. And this is another traditional method of mosaic cutting because a lot of mosaic artists don't actually even use a glass cutter. They only use this tool. Of course, Linda and I have been able to enjoy Stacy's artwork for many, many, many years. And we hope we showed you something <laughs> in this video just to give you a sneak peek at some <laughs> of the stuff that she's done. You've seen just a, just a fraction. Hey, you guys, thank you for coming along in this video. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you around. Ha, 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 ha.